Let's turn now, friends, to our study, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 3, and we can take for a reference the words of verse 25. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. <clears throat> King Agrippa in the New Testament said when he was exposed to gospel preaching, almost thou hast persuaded me to be a Christian. He was having a religious experience. And that's something of what Nebuchadnezzar was having when Daniel interpreted his dreams. He had a religious experience. He declared in chapter 2, verse 47, Your God is a God of gods. But the problem, my friends, with religious experiences is they can fade away eventually. Nebuchadnezzar was far more fascinated by the image of himself that Daniel portrayed to him, the statue with the golden head. And as time went on, he forgot both his experience and his admiration for Daniel's God. But meanwhile, this man could, at least at a political level, could really boast because his kingdom covered, as we saw, the virtually the entire Middle East of that day. He had conquered all before him. And I would guess that his chief prize would have been Jerusalem. He left it a smoking ruin. No one had ever done that before. So the proud king built this 90-foot colossus of gold. Now I want you to notice his size. I'm just going to say a brief word about this. I'm not into uh, biblical numerics, but I think this size of this uh, Colossus deserves a brief comment. In verse 1 of this chapter, it's described for us as 60 cubits by 6 cubits. Now, uh, in the Western world, we use a base number 10 in our system of arithmetic. But in ancient Babylon, they used base number 60. And that's how we ended up with 60 seconds uh, a minute and 60 minutes an hour. It goes all the way back to Babylonian ways of working out arithmetic. Now, the key number to the Babylonians wasn't so much 60 as 6. And this went back to heathen times when the heathen called the man's day the sixth day, referring or alluding to the sixth day of creation. So they called it man's day. And that's why the number six, or one, one reason at least, for the number six to be so significant to them. So the number six focused on man. This is the day man was created. Now, as time moved on and we come into the modern world, man's day became human's day. In other words, humanism, which we are more than familiar with in our own day. And humanism is where God is excluded. Man is the center of his own universe, independent of God, autonomous, sovereign. And this, by the way, as you can guess, is where we get the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation 666. Goes all the way back to Babylon. I just thought I would mention that in the passing. In any case, these were the dimensions of Nebuchadnezzar's um, statue, the exalting himself as much as he possibly could. 
And it's no doubt that it was designed to deify Nebuchadnezzar, to make him into a god and thereby get all the citizens to worship him. And we saw that in verses 4 and 5. Now, this worked, as we saw last week, except for three men. Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. In verse 12, we read of their resistance to bow before this image. So they, along with Daniel, of course, believed in a very different God. They believed in Jehovah God, who was intolerant of any kind of idolatry. And these men feared their God far more than they feared this Nebuchadnezzar and his threats of death. Now, I think this reminds us, and um, the whole idea of the, 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 the children of Israel, or at least the citizens of Jerusalem, living in Babylon and living for a long time. And, and we know they were there for 70 years. In fact, some of them were there for 90 years. Some of them never came back at all. So they were living in a very hostile environment. And it does remind us of how Christian people in every era, uh, they live, as it were, in two kingdoms. And we walk a tightrope between those two kingdoms. We are, first and foremost, citizens in the kingdom of God. And to God we owe everything. But we also live in the kingdom of men. We also owe the kingdom of men certain duties and obligations. We live there, we work there, we raise our families there, and we have to respect, to a certain extent at least, the kingdom of men. We have to uphold its laws, we have to pay our taxes, and we have to support our communities and so on. Yet, everything the Christian does has first of all to be squared in with the word and the laws of God as these are revealed to us in the Bible. Now sometimes this can create huge tensions for the people of God. Now like these men, we have to um, make sure that we don't compromise on our beliefs that we nail our colours to the mast and that the world around us know whose we are and whom we serve. Just like Joshua encouraged his own people. Now, at that level, I believe that the Christian church has been far too slack and far too silent. The world, my friends, is walking all over us. They're dismissing your protests. They're pouring scorn on our beliefs and our values. And we are silent. We are not defending our faith. And we are not fighting for our God as we ought to and as we should. But I think, my friends, if not for our own sakes, then for the sakes of our children and our children's children and the generations yet unborn, we have to make a better job of standing up for our God. Anyway, let me move on first of all to look at the role of pride and jealousy in the story. Nebuchadnezzar realized the importance of religious and religion and religious expression to humanity. He understood that much. This was a clever, clever man. Now, he understood that every man is a spiritual religious being. Everyone. Now, that's no surprise to us because we know everyone has been created in the image of God. And however much that image has been, deemed, been marred and defaced by sin, man is still a man created in the image of God. And by definition, man is a spiritual, religious creature. How he expresses that, that's another matter altogether. Now, wise leaders will always know how to channel those desires in men and women under their care. Now, that's the folly, by the way, of modern communism. They insist that they can extract religious expression from their citizens. And they have failed. They have failed miserably. This man was far wiser. He understood these things, as this narrative shows, and further on in the story as well, as we shall see. However, for a man who showed such brilliance as a leader, 
he was woefully short in understanding other aspects of human conduct. When he promoted Daniel and his three friends, wouldn't you have thought that he would have asked himself, how is this going to go down with native Babylonians? How are they going to take three, four Hebrew men ruling over them? That question didn't seem to have arisen in his mind at all, which, in my view, is very surprising. And because he didn't think about it, he missed the resentment that was building up in all his lieutenants because of these four men who were ruling over them. So granting foreigners the privilege of high office and making them overseers of native politicians, it was bound to cause a disaster, and it did. The Chaldeans, the astrologers, the wizards, the court advisors, they never forgot how Daniel made them look stupid when they failed to interpret the dreams. They never forgot that. He exposed their charlatan claims to unlock the mysteries of life. Now, to have him and his friends ruling over them, well, uh, when I was preparing this, I, I was thinking, this reminds me of what God said to Cain at the beginning of history. And God used this phrase very deliberately. He looked at Cain and he said to him, Sin lieth at thy door. And the word God used there, translated in, in our version as lieth, is the word for crouching. And it's the idea of a wild animal crouching, waiting to pounce on its victim. And that's what we have here. These Chaldeans were crouching, waiting for the opportunity to pounce on the people of God, these three men, as well as Daniel. Now, I'm not very sure how these three men made their protest known on the plain of Jura. I'm not sure what they did they attend the ceremony and simply refuse to bow when everybody else bowed? Or did they articulate verbally their protest? Or did they absent themselves altogether? I, I, I don't know. There's, there's no indication of it. But whatever the case, they made the brave stand. Come what may. And when this news emerged, the Chaldeans, they saw their opportunity for revenge. So like the wild animals they were, they pounced. Verse 8. At that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. And in their jealous rage, they hatched a five-point plan in their approach to Nebuchadnezzar. First of all, they demonstrate respect and praise for their king. Verse 9. O king, live forever. And you can imagine how this would have puffed his chest out even more. Then secondly, they reminded the king of the edict he had ordered and its threat of the fiery furnace there in verse 11. Thirdly, they ensured that Nebuchadnezzar knew exactly who these men were, their ethnic background. Verse 12, certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. In other words, these are the men you favoured over us, Jews, the despised Hebrews. Fourthly, to guarantee Nebuchadnezzar knew the exact identity of these men, they named them. Verse 12 again. Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. These men, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. And finally, they spelt out their accusation in verse 12, the end of verse 12. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now they knew what the response to this would be. They knew it would inflame Nebuchadnezzar's pride and anger, and they weren't disappointed. Verse 13. In his rage and fury, Nebuchadnezzar commanded to bring Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego before him. 
So between the Chaldeans' jealousy and Nebuchadnezzar's pride, it all seemed to seal the fate of these good, holy men of God. You know, one of the ugliest expressions of sin in the human story is jealousy. Jealousy, my friends, is a horrible, horrible thing. And I think that's one of the reasons why it is given such a awful, ominous description in the Bible. You'll find this description in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Jealousy, it says, is as cruel as the grave. As cruel as the grave. So when pride and jealousy conspire in the human heart, there's no telling, my friends, how cruel the outcome will be. I suppose the best example we have of this is at the cross of Calvary. There you see pride and jealousy in, co- in, 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 in concert, as it were, against the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, we live in a very unforgiving world where conspiracies like this between pride and jealousy are constantly being played out, especially against the Lord's people in so many different ways. And it's happening here in our island, in our communities. Now, we may never, of course, have to face a fiery furnace. Yet Christians frequently face incredible discrimination, incredible discrimination. We know that many Christians are demoted in the workplace. We know that many of them are ostracized by their colleagues. We know that many of them are mocked for their views and for their beliefs. When the accuser of the brethren, that's how the devil is described in the Bible, when he fires his arrows, he doesn't care where that arrow hits and he doesn't care how fiery that arrow might be. In fact, the more damage it does, the happier Satan is. As Shakespeare would say, as far as Satan is concerned, it's off with their heads with no mercy. Well, let's look at the faith of these three men. Amazing faith. These Chaldeans succeeded to stir the worst in their king. Now, 20 years ago, 20 years before this, that is, he he prays on Daniel's God. But here we see how superficial, how shallow, how disingenuous the praise of man can be where God is concerned. The unbelievers' uh, gratitude to God and to Christianity is always... Uh, and they're, they're, You'll hear expressions of gratitude from unbelieving people towards God, towards Christianity, and towards the church. But it's always contingent. It's always conditional. It's always short-lived. At this stage, the king's former admiration of God, that's all gone. And he has no qualms with threatening Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. Here's what he said to them, verse 15. If you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Then he mockingly asked them, Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? I'm always amazed at the answer given to that question. With quiet confidence, this is what they said, verse 16. We are not careful. I don't think that's a very good translation. Perhaps it would be better. We don't need to answer you in this matter. We don't need to answer you. Here they are being threatened with being thrown into a burning fiery furnace. And we don't have to answer you for that. It's incredible. Now I'm not very sure where this furnace might have been uh, geographically located. But I would guess, quite likely, it would have been located somewhere in the vicinity of the towering statue. Now, the reason I'm saying that is 
that this would make the threat that much more real. And we know from the annals of Christian church history that God's enemies took perverse delight in tormenting and torturing their victims. So it's easy to imagine that the furnace would be located somewhere in the vicinity of the statue so that the threat would be all the more real to those who refused to bow. However, it made no difference to these three magnificent men. Their faith was outstanding. Their next words demonstrate a true Christian mindset. And oh, my friends, how I long to have this mindset myself. Verses 17 and 18. Our God is able to deliver us. But it doesn't stop there. But even if he doesn't, we will not become idolaters. I get embarrassed every time I read those words. I get embarrassed, my friends, because I know that I wouldn't have said those words. I wouldn't have spoken those words. I haven't got that Christian courage. Nebuchadnezzar's reply shows how deep and pathological man's hatred for God is and what we see in his face. We can only say that it must have been echoed as they drove the nails into the hands and feet of our Saviour at Calvary. Verse 19. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. His face became contorted with hatred for these men. This is in turn, I think, reminds us, my friends, there's always darker forces working in Christian persecution. Always. Nebuchadnezzar, Judas Iscariot, Nero, Stalin, Hitler, all these were evil, evil men. But there was a more evil one working in them and through them. You remember what is said in Luke 22 about Judas Iscariot. And the devil went into Judas. Now, I'm, I don't agree with the, with, the, um, with the great theologian who wrote a masterful piece, a two-volume book on, on the life and times of Messiah, Eidersheim. I don't agree with Eidersheim when he says that if Satan hadn't gone into Judas's heart, he would never have done what he did. I don't agree with that. Judas didn't need Satan to do what he did. But nevertheless, Satan takes delight in going into the hearts of men like that and making them infinitely more evil than they already were. And that's what's happening here with Nebuchadnezzar. But I believe it's also happening in the world around us today. Because of a corrupt media, my friends, we are left unaware of the sheer cruelty being perpetrated against our brothers and sisters in Christ every day, today, in this world. If it wasn't for Christian literature, and even Christian literature doesn't report on all of our persecution, but the little information we have comes from people like, like the Barnabas Fund people. But it's only a fraction of what Christians are suffering. And I've suffered this very Sabbath day as we enjoyed fellowship with one another and with our God. Men and women suffered, died for the love to Jesus Christ. And behind it all, my friends, is the orchestrating hand of the evil one. 
So here, the evil one is not content with throwing Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego into the furnace. Oh, that's not enough for him. Nebuchadnezzar commanded, verse 19, heat the furnace seven times more than usual. That's hard to believe, my friends. A burning, fiery furnace is a burning, fiery furnace. Why would you want to heat it seven times more? His irrational conduct continues. Verse 20. He commanded the most mighty men in his army to bind Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. But why? Why did he want them tied up? They're not resisting. They're not fighting. They haven't got weapons. However, tied they were and fed to the flames along with their clothes and every shred of their existence. That's a picture we get in verse 21. Every evidence that they ever existed thrown into that burning fiery furnace. 600 years later, this spirit again emerged and the same evil hand was orchestrating it against Jesus Christ. Listen to these words. They are in prophetic form, but they are talking about the spirit that prevail at Calvary. You'll find them in Psalm 41, verse 5. Now, try and grasp the vehemence behind these words. When shall he die and his name perish? God is never blind to that kind of persecution, my friends. God is never deaf to that kind of vitriol against his beloved. And sometimes God intervenes in poetic justice. And that's what happened here. In this instance, such was the heat of the furnace that the fire designed to kill the people of God slew instead the soldiers that dragged them to the furnace. Verse 22. The flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Mesach and Abednego. Did that make Nebuchadnezzar think again? Not at all. Left to his own devices, there is only one trajectory to the evil heart of man. Paul summed it up very well with these words right into Timothy. He waxes worse and worse. That's evil man for you, my friends. He waxes worse and worse. So these three brave men were cruelly cast into the raging fire. Now I want you to notice the sequence of events that followed. First of all, we are told of the appearance of this fourth man. Now, Nebuchadnezzar obviously must have been keeping an eye on the furnace, possibly to gloat, as these men, so he thought, would slowly suffer and die. But suddenly, he shoots up to his feet, and asks a question of nobody in particular. Verse 24. The king was astonished and rose up in haste and asked, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And then, I suppose with a degree of panic, he claims, Lo, I see four men. There's been a bit of controversy, by the way, over the description he gave of this fourth man, like the Son of God. We're going to take it at face value. No reason why we can't. The second thing, Nebuchadnezzar noted that only the ropes were burnt. The clothes weren't burnt. The hair wasn't burnt. That was all untouched. Verse 27. Only the ropes were gone. And this immediately caught his attention. Middle of verse 25. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. Now make sure you catch the significance of that. 
Three men walking with the fourth man. Or should I put that the other way? The fourth man walking with the three men. And thirdly, Nebuchadnezzar did what Jesus would do centuries later at the grave of a dead friend. Only it's not Lazarus come forth, we hear here, but verse 26, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth. What the Bible calls the last enemy snatched Lazarus from the land of the living and brought him into the realm of death. So these men that Nebuchadnezzar got his way, they would also have been cast into the realm of death. God's son restored Lazarus, you remember, to the fullness of life. But see what happens here. The same Son of God preserves these men in the fullness of life, demonstrating his sovereignty over all things, even a raging fire. You also may remember that Jesus emphasized to those who saw the risen Lazarus that eternal life and true liberty go hand in hand. You remember what he said in John 11. Loose him and let him go. What terrific, victorious words. Victorious over death. Loose him and let him go. And that's the significance I see in the scene here of the fiery furnace. Four men, loose, walking in the midst of the fire. But they weren't just walking, were they? They were walking with the Son of God. And the Son of God was walking with them. And that's the key, my friends, to our own eternal security. That we be found walking with the Son of God, and that the Son of God would be found walking with ourselves in this world. Let me close with this. It is quite likely that the prophet Isaiah meant the Red Sea, the River Jordan, and the fires of this furnace when he wrote these words, words you know well, Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. There's the Red Sea. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. There's the River Jordan. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burnt, neither shall the flame kindle upon you. There's the fiery furnace of Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego. And that, my friends, is the promise given to each one of us that will trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is one thing sure, sooner or later, you are going to walk through those waters. You are going to have to pass through those raging rivers. You are going to have to go through fire of one kind or another in this world. It is almost impossible to escape this world without going through these things. But here's the promise. I will be with you. And when you go through these things, you remember the picture of the fiery furnace, the Son of God walking with his believing people and his believing people walking with the Son of God. This is the gospel, my friends, through and through, as it is from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and blessed God, Undertake for us now as we try to grasp these high and lofty truths 
as we try to apply them to ourselves in so many different ways. Oh, we thank thee, Lord, that thy beloved Son came into this world to walk with men, and that he is walking with us every day by his Spirit, and that he is delivering us from all kinds of trials and tribulations. Preserve us, O gracious God. Preserve us in life, through life, and preserve us into the great eternity. For thy glory's sake. Amen. Stand. <clears throat> now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <clears throat>